Today on Zero to Land, we're going to be taking a journey into the world of the small. You might notice in my microscope here it's missing an eyepiece. Well, that's to your advantage. So here's what I've done. I've taken a Samsung Galaxy S3 and on the back I've glued on this plate which rests on the right eyepiece and I have this plastic bracket and this bracket came from one of these clip-on ferrite cores. I did have to trim down the diameter of the eyepiece on the lathe a little bit but that's okay because it worked super well. So I get to simply put that right on my microscope now, press the button and stand at this like I'm ordering from a vending machine. Here we go. So I want to take some video footage on this and I want to post it up and I want to see how well it works and see how you guys like it. And uh, it's just going to be a kind of one of those rough videos where I post up a bunch of different things and kind of talk about what's underneath the viewfinder. So as you can see, I can zoom in and out and stuff like that, all sorts of goodies, along with changing my objective uh, focal power and moving the table and the stage around, whichever way you want to call it, and then looking at things and doing the focus. And the phone will do autofocus, so even if I'm a little bit out of focus, I can just tap it, and it usually focuses. Of course, it would focus there. Timing is perfect on that one. But, you know, you get what I mean. So, I'm going to be doing a bunch of just video shots to talk about things, and hopefully it'll be a really fun video for everybody who's watching it. So here's some Labradorite. Uh, we can see the blue shimmer when I move the light up and down in the material. Let's take a look at the material a little bit more. I'm going to put a light stationary. Stay. Good enough. Alright, so move around the crystal. And there you can see all the green structures on the top of the surface. Ooh, that's a very nice spot right there. So, very beautiful stone. It's one of my favorite stones. I really like that spot. Let's see if we can get uh, closer to that. Yeah, I think we can. Let's see. So, yeah, even deeper in, you can see the grain structures. Let's back to that. Lower power, magnification. Yeah, it still looks like a rock. Who would have thought? the other way, see what we can get on this uh, outer edge here, I'll flip it over. So this is the unpolished side, and you can see uh, the tool marks in there, where they cut it, zoom back out. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. See what's in there. Uh, more magnification. Oh, the color that comes out of this rock is amazing. It really is. That is cool. Let's do another rock. 
Alright, so here we have my favorite stone that I have. I have very few stones. A lot of my stones got stolen, actually. But this is a piece of uncut precious opal, so it's unfinished. And it's, uh, it's just a beautiful piece of opal. Just an immaculate piece. My god, that's beautiful. And uh, this has some of the same kind of refractive properties. So if I move this around, you can see the colors change as well. So I love opal. I love things that have rainbows to be shaken out of them. Here I move it over. I'm going to move the light with moving the microscope so you can kind of see the effects that the light has on the different grains in the opal. Oh, that's that's wonderful. We're going to get in that area for sure. Now, this is not a flat object, so not all of the perspective is going to be in the same focal range. So you're going to see some blurring in some areas and uh, not in some others. But that just has to do with how far the particular piece of rock is away from the objective lens. Oh, that's beautiful. All right, so here I have a praying mantis, and this is the one with the wings folded out, and it's not in the box. So we get to flip it around and take a look at all the interesting features. And right now, it's the antennas. So these are the antennas on the praying mantis. Very long, very delicate. And you can see there's little hairs that are sticking out for them per segment. And let's get back to the head. Take a look at that in more detail. Yeah, so those are the little compound eye lenses. And uh, then the praying mantis actually has three simple eyes top of its head see if I can locate those for you and that way where are you guys uh, that one of them nope I don't think so let's go back to the lower magnification oh yeah okay so those are three simple eyes that lay on the front of the praying mantis's head as well so they are actually have five eyes two compound eyes these three simple eyes right here in the front. It's pretty cool. Go down towards the body of the mantis. More so. There's only so much I can move this mantis with the table. Scooch, scooch, scooch. All right, now by the wings. So this is where the wings interlock on the praying mantis' body on the sides. So that's a wing assembly right there. And across from the body, you can see the other wing where it connects in. And these are the cover wings. And then there's the flight wings, which are down here. Those are connected a little bit more securely, have more muscle mass because they have to be flying. Yeah. 
uh, scoot it down a little bit more so we can take a look at the wings. So there are two wings. Let's take a look at the cover wings first. The cover wings are a little thicker. These uh, assist more with the steering. Let's see. So all those networks of uh, blood vessels in the wing. Back over to this one, see a little, a little bit more light. Alright, and on to the flight wings. Uh, flight wings fold up kind of like a fan does. Uh, you can see down here where the wings are starting to intersect at the muscle area and follow this out and we can see that uh, they start to form kind of fan kind of flute out Inside one of those little vessels. So these are the little forearms, the praying mantis, the little claws. Good look at the praying mantis foot. Yeah. Here's a good look at the praying mantis foot. It has little toes. That's cool. And two little gripper claws at the end. And little hairs. Inside of the legs area. So here we're looking at a small scorpion. This is a small scorpion necklace. Little black scorpion. Here we got the abdomen. And here's the head of the scorpion, or the head area, jaw area in the front. Uh, we got the two little pincers, all those little air bubbles you can see trapped in there. Of course, we as we go out, we got the chromatic aberration and the issues with focusing due to the outside of the periphery of the plastic. But the, the yeah, same thing here. We'll uh, look at it from the bottom, get a closer image of that. See if we can get a good image of the pincer on the top. A little poker here, and there's the tail and the venom gland. Yeah, let's flip this over. Okay, here in the back side of that scorpion pendant, we can see a lot more detail because the plastic is flat. And there's the uh, tail, the pins here, and the abdomen, the bottom side now, looking at it, and 
go over to the mouth and get a much clearer image now because the plastic is flat. Just focus in on that. We have a high magnification. Take a look at that. And here it is. Lots of little parts going on inside of a scorpion mouth. And then we have the pincers. So the pincers would follow up that. And we gotta be getting close to a pincer. That's another joint. What's that here? Yeah, that's one of the pincers. A very small, very fine pincer. A little feet uh, with the uh, hooks at the end. I see both the hooks on that one. Another one of the uh, joints, I think it looks like. Oh, that's interesting. There's like two little holes. I never knew that. Interesting. Very interesting. Let's see, what do we have here? Looks like more scorpion body. Oh, it really is freaky looking, isn't it? It's the bottom of the scorpion with the legs intercept. It's time for the bigger scorpion dropped in plastic. So here, again, looking at the bottom. Yeah, there's the mouth. And we can take a look at the pincers. So, there's the connecting arm or leg. Far less air bubbles on this. Good quality. So, oh, let's take a look. So that's cool. Higher magnification. There's the end, that's cool. Little uh little grippers on there. Let's see if we can get to the back. So there's lots of air in the little hairs that are on a scorpion trapped along the body. You can see those air pockets underneath. And there's more of that air trapped in with the scorpion. You can kind of see it. And back to the tail. You may and or may not have known this, but scorpions glow under a black light. 
or ultraviolet light, and that's because of the chemical in their chitin. It's a fluorescent chemical, which means that when the black light strikes it, it glows. So, uh, in this case, the 400 nanometer light, when it strikes it, emits like a 500, and say 50 nanometer light. So it's uh, kind of like an orangey green by itself. Let's see if we can go up by the mouth. Here we a little bit here from the abdomen. The air bubble area preventing the ultraviolet light from kind of getting in there. I'm gonna scoot over the ultraviolet light here too. Here, there we go. Oh, that's nice. Okay, so here is I think one of the legs. Let's follow that out. See what that is. Oh, that's freaky. Like a little glowing alien. That is one of the pincers, isn't it? Or is it a foot? Not there yet. It's a foot. God, that's crazy. Thumbnail. Anyway. Let's take a look at one of the pincers. Yeah, we can see the pincer now in that same area that has those little claws on it, little ridges, those uh, serrations. The serrations are cool. Let's go over to the mouth area a little bit. Wow. That is awesome. That is the mouth of the scorpion. And it's just glowing away. That is fantastic. There's the other mandibles underneath. That's where they connect to. Yeah, right there. So it's basically where the mandibles connect to, I think. And uh, the tail here. Let's get into those watches now. So this is an old Timex watch, and this is basically the everyday working watch. Pretty simple. This is when they were easily mass produced. So here we have the crown, which is where it was wound. And uh, going back towards the inside of the watch, you can see the mechanisms that are inside. So from that point, it drives a gear that is in that assembly down there. And that gear drives a couple more gears that are interlocked. And it spring loads the spring that's inside of this canister. So this is a gear that has a spring on the inside of it. And that gear drives the rest of the gearing so let's take a look at where that kind of goes so you can kind of see some of the gears moving around in there I think that is the second hand gear underneath there and uh, we're gonna go over to yeah, that's another gear it's probably the hour hand one of those oh no everything's on the faceplate that's right so you can see that there's no jewels in this at all uh, all of those are just machine doors as usual. Kind of looks transparent. Could be uh, like an aluminum oxide uh, jewel in there. Didn't say it had jewels, so. Here's uh, another view of the second hand gear. Kind of chiming away. And the flywheel assembly. So, no, oh, here, here we go. Okay. So, this gear that you're looking at right here underneath. You'll notice that the teeth kind of get staggered in one direction. 
in uh, a lot of watch assemblies, most watch assemblies, it will be connected to this little fork. And you can see one of those little fork legs right there. And it has this little pin on it. And the pin gets pushed up and out of the way. And then the flywheel swings it back down in position. And that's for keeping the time. And on uh, some of the other watches, this is probably easier to see. Yeah, there we go. So we got that arm right there. And that arm connects to the flywheel. Here's a Sears and Robux watch. And, uh, it's a little bit more of a, a fancy watch. has some of the jewels and stuff, but still pretty much a basic kind of everyday watch. Not too much special. Let's see, we can go into the same winding mechanism area. See what we can discover in this section. So, the same set of pins that go into it for setting the date and time and then winding it. And you can see the little square shaft, and then the gear right there, and that will engage in two different areas depending on what you're doing, setting the date and time or winding it. And this area, the winding mechanism, this particular piece right here is the lock. So when you're winding it, that spring right there will give the gear a little bit of constant tension against that lock and it'll click into place and that's the piece that you feel clicking against you when you wind a mechanical watch. So that's the main gear spring. The gear spring in this is partially failed. The uh, gear spring doesn't hold on anymore. You can see it's not moving anymore. Oh yes it is okay. I was wrong. It's just moving very slowly. Cool. Well, moving is more entertaining. Nine out of ten people will agree with that. Unadjusted. Let's see. I get towards the moving bits a little bit more. Okay, so it does have jewels in it. Let's see. Things have it. Okay, so when they refer to jewels, they often refer to rubies um, because that's what they used to make the pivots out of. I mean, just, it was a lot smoother. It was a lot harder. And the gemstones really held up. So, like right there. So in this case, ruby was just a term, kind of like you would hear, uh, like a ball bearing, so or ceramic bearing. This is what they had. They had gemstones, so they had to fabricate those using the gemstones. And we look at the flywheel assembly here. Let's see. So, oh yeah, okay. So, check this out. This is probably the smallest part inside of a watch, right here. This assembly. I'm gonna point that out. And uh, I tried to fix one of these ones, and it was a nightmare. Okay, so, check this out. Sorry for the bumps. Okay, that spring right there is about the width of a human hair. So it's a very tiny spring. And uh, I wanted to replace the spring on it. The little wedge piece right there gets driven uh, into a point and it holds the spring in place so there's a little mount and a couple of the other watches you can see the other side of the mount above the speed adjust system where that spring gets put in but that little wedge is incredibly small I mean, it's a very tiny wedge uh, I mean obviously I'm using a microscope to observe it but I mean it's one of the smallest pieces probably if not the smallest piece uh, in a watch back to here And there's the adjustment arm, which allows you to set the spring tension and kind of set the pace of which this operates. Let's see. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. So here's that same mechanism. You'll notice that it's still kind of sloped to one side, and uh, so this wheel, this. Uh, gear here it puts energy into the flywheel and then when a flywheel comes back it returns that energy and you'll see two little points there's one jewel pivot right there one kind of jeweled tooth and then here you'll see another one and this is what keeps the watch at the correct time it said orbit on the front 
This doesn't say Orvin on the inside. Interesting. Oh, hey. Hey. That. That is cool. What is that? That's like the ruby. You're looking right through that. Oh, that is trippy. Yes. Closer, please. Oh, you can see right through that jeweled pivot. That's very good machining. Okay, satisfied at that. And moving on. Anything interesting otherwise in here? Uh, yes, you can see the, the adjustment right here. So that is what I mean. So this is an adjustment section there. See, and that is what is adjusting the spring tension. So if that's moved, it changes the distance of which the spring can kind of travel. And underneath here, uh, when I was talking about that one pivot, or that spring, little wedge that goes in there, that's the little end of the pivot that holds it into position. It's a very small little device, little part. Take a look at the crown and track through the watch. So, the crown starts out here, comes in, so that's the drive gear right here that drives this gear, and this gear drives the larger gear. So that's the larger gear that stores the mechanical energy, energy that ha with the spring in it, yeah that's it. And uh, we'll see the same locking mechanism around here somewhere by it. Where is that locking mechanism? This is really distracting. Like I'm doing two-handed tasks that I'm not used to. Brand new device. Oh, well that's an unfortunate place for the shadow to come in and block things. Okay, well, you know, that's around there somewhere. Let's see, moving on. So, let's get back to the section that has the flywheel in it. The timing wheel is my favorite part. It always is. I think it's everybody's favorite part. Alright, so there's the top of the ruby for the flywheel. And underneath, you can see the flywheel escapement. But this has something I want to point out now that we're here. So zoom in on that. You'll see. I'm going to stop it real quick. Not recommended you do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Okay, you'll notice that there is a little screw right there. That little screw, uh, among a couple other ones, are put in there, and they are for balancing. So the flywheels are balanced. Instead of being drilled into to remove the material, they add material to balance the flywheel. And those are little balance, balancing screws on there. And those are very tiny balancing screws. Really cool. I like how they look. This is a Yamaha watch, and it's a little bit smaller, but it's also an automatic one, which means that it's a self-winding watch. And uh, I'll show you what that is. So, you get to the center of the watch, right here. All right, so the center of the watch has this weight on it, and I'm going to follow the outline of the weight as best as I can. So the weight right there. Uh, that's the outer periphery of the weight. Um, it's like etch a sketch, man, but way harder. Okay, and the outside periphery of the weight. And then back to the center of the watch. So that's a ball bearing, and that weight rests on that ball bearing. So, if I... Take 
and move it, you'll see that uh, the weight can move back and forth, and that weight, when you're wearing it, actually winds up the watch. So let's see if I can move this over carefully with my hands and show you the mechanism. Let's see if I can find the mechanism. Leave it on this side. Is that it? Yep, okay, so that has very fine teeth in there. And uh, there's like this little uh, like caliper assembly. And what it does is no matter which way the weight moves, the assembly is designed to take that energy and switch it over. That way the watch is utilizing the energy no matter which way it's going. And you can see kind of how it... Oh, I, I see. Okay, it's fully wound right now. But you can see how it drives that gear. And that mechanical assembly, it's really hard to explain unless you've seen it. But it's a really odd shape and setup. It's cool. It's really cool. Uh, let's move on to the other parts. <laughs> Over to the flywheel assembly. There's that same little insert. Hey, that one's held in with a screw. This one's slightly serviceable. Cool. And we have the same, oh, that's a triway uh, little clip there. It's a very nice clip. And the ruby pivot, or ruby, yeah, ruby pivot. Okay. Save the prettiest for last. This is a little Sussex woman's watch. And it's a pretty small watch, but it also shows a lot of the moving parts in really good detail. So let's start over in the same area, the crown area, where you wind it. And you can see the crown here comes over to this area. And there drives that same gear that I was talking about earlier. Then there's the bigger gear that it hooks up to, which is that gear. This watch is a little wobbly, I'm sorry about that. Uh, and then that same block. So right there is that spring-loaded lock that keeps it from unwinding after you wind it. This gear right here is the second hand gear which is going to be in the center of the watch. So I believe that's on that pivot. And then we got, yeah that's a, yep, on that pivot. So that's the second hand gear on that pivot. So I tried to get this to work. I couldn't get this to work the other day and I was like okay well what am I going to do? So I decided well I don't have anything to lose, and this, this is a little too small for me to work on. So, I stuck my finger to the tap water, and I made a little high-pressured water jet. And then I took the heat gun to it, and got her good and hot. So I drove out all the water, and that seemed to have worked pretty well. As you can see, it's running pretty nicely. Uh, we can see the same weight, since this is a smaller flywheel. Uh, they put weights on it. Yeah, it's moving a little fast for you to see. Here's that anchor point for the spring. So the spring assembly is right there. Yeah, you can see that weight. So that weight's kind of swinging around. All those weights are swinging around. And that slows down the wheel. The more weight there is, the more the wheel is slowed. So one more watch, and it's not a mechanical watch, well it is a mechanical watch, but it's an electromechanical watch, this is a Timex Electric. So what's different about this one? So we get the shaft for setting the time, and familiar gearing, well what's different about this watch? Okay, let's take a look at the flywheel. So here's the flywheel. And if you notice the flywheel, here it is right there, has a coil on one side. So I'm going to follow it around, and there's the other side of the flywheel, and back around to that coil, which is right here. 
So, so hold it down a little bit. Give it a nudge, cause there's no battery in it. So you see how that kind of moves a little bit. So the assembly works. I don't think I can quite find it and show you. I think that's all buried in the assembly. But the assembly works because the coil would get a little boost from a battery. And when it left off the contact, the momentum would carry it around and move the gear. And then when the, when the flywheel came back, it would touch the battery contact again and get another little boost of electricity that would send it back off on its merry way. And I can't really see any uh, electrical contacts that I'm quite aware of, but they're somewhere in there. Uh, as I said, probably underneath the metal, the metal plating and buried inside of the watch mechanism. But yeah, a little of a hybrid between the mechanical watch and the electric watch. This is uh, not quartz movement, but it's also powered by battery. Instead of winding it up, it didn't uh, last very long. They didn't uh, make these too many years from what I know about them. Here's kind of an odd setup for an LCD display. This is from an old digital handy cam screen. And you'll notice that the pixels are kind of staggered with the red on top and the green and blue on the bottom in a triangular fashion. This is the clearest image that I can kind of get. You'll notice uh, it's a little blurry. That's because the screen itself has a matte finish on the top. So I'll flip it over and we can take a look at that a little bit more. So you'll notice that uh, it'll uh, just kind of keep blurry. But there's something cool about the matte finish. Watch this. So uh, I kind of like the way these pixels are staggered, to be honest. Oh, that's cool looking. Here's an iPhone 4 display. That's pretty small pixels, all in all. Let's go on to the higher magnification. So yeah, pretty tiny. Really clean image on that. Quite nice. So here's organic LED. An organic LED looks a little different. As you can see, there's a lot of just really super black color where the LEDs aren't lit up, and I like the contrast of the organic LED a lot better. You can zoom in on that. It's a focal range higher. And right there. So a little organic LED, light emitting LEDs, a really interesting configuration. Again, we can see that uh, blue bars are longer than the green and the red. So a little bit of a different configuration on there, as far as how they treat the colors. Let's see, that's uh, really interesting, isn't it? Take a look at another organic LED display. See how it looks. See if it has the same staggered arrangement. Here's the organic LCD on the Samsung Galaxy S3. A little bit of a different setup as far as the organic pixels or organic LED pixels. Uh, you can see that the blue is a little bit bigger than the green, and the red is a little bit of a weird square shape in the center. Let's get a closer look at that. Oh yeah, take a look at that.
Here's an organic LED display that I have pulled apart and here is the emitting layer and you can see all the little cells inside if I go into closer magnification we can get even more of a closer look of how those cells are on the inside another cool thing is they glow under a black light so I'm going to take this light off and I'm going to put the black light on and you'll see that these cells start to glow so let's try with a deeper range black light from the 400 to 365 nanometers you can see a little less blue see the green and the uh, red come out a little bit more Here's one of the LCD panels from a three-way LCD projector, and three of these panels would go around the dichroic cross cube, one of them responsible for each one of the primary colors. So because these are monochrome panels, they don't have any red, green, and blue bands in them. One panel handles one color. So it's kind of like a calculator screen. In the areas that are little squares, the squares can either be passive or uh, opaque. So, uh, yeah. Each one of those little cells, like a number on a calculator screen, can get darker or lighter and therefore allows light to go through or not. And I have a little bit of an image, a little bit of a video of that running on one of the teardowns that I did on the three-way LCD projector. But you can see this run. Zoom in a little bit more. So yeah, each one of those are the pixels. This is liquid crystal on silicon, and this was pulled from a three-way DLP uh, TV. And this is not a DMD or digital mirror device. Let's take a closer look. You can see that there are these little itty bitty tiny squares. And I zoom in closer, uh, higher magnification. Uh, I gotta go find where those squares are again. That's a cover glass. Okay, here we go. So these little squares right here are kind of like uh, LCD, uh, like it's like a calculator screen again, but it's a reflective screen instead of being one that acts like a window. So instead of the image being passed through a monochromatic screen, uh, like a, uh, you know, it would be reflected off like a calculator screen a little bit more so. So each one of those are your little pixels, and it is small. This is a digital mirror device, and a digital mirror device is what's commonly associated with the DLP. And you'll notice that the mirrors are kind of at a 45 degree angle. Let's see if we find some bad pixels. Uh, yeah, okay, so when a DLP TV or projector goes bad, because those pixels, those little mirrors, end up getting stuck in position. So we got some stuck mirrors right there. Zoom in on those a little bit. But yeah, each one of those are physically tilting mirrors. You can see some other bad pixels right there in the area. Or are they bad pixels? They're kind of just in that orange area. Interesting. Here's another DLP DMD chip. So more little mirrors on there. So let's zoom in to the higher magnification. Ah, uh, there they go. A little bit of a different setup on this. Let's go to the edge and see how the edge looks. 
So these are, once again, the little mirrors that end up moving. And I wonder if they move on the same 90 degree plane. So you can tell that by the edge. Hey, that's strange again. That has to be for like barcoding. I mean, it has to be. So you can see where they tilted the little mirrors back and forth. That it has to be for barcoding. I've never seen that anywhere else. God, that is bizarre. What a strange way to, I mean, it's, I mean, not a bad way, but what a strange way to encode information on your chips. Interesting, and that, that same thing, it goes all the way around, doesn't it? I think it does. Well, I'm learning new shit. Yeah, it does. God, that's strange. Yeah, pretty cool. Let's take a look at some computer chips under the microscope. And I'm not sure exactly what all these are. So we're just going to go and just look at them. They are pretty. Go to that one now. It's going to be a similar chip. These are both, I believe, from the Xbox 360. And those are the little copper substrates underneath. And we'll take some closer views of all of these as well. Awesome looking. There was some other way cooler chips though. Like this guy. So this one doesn't have that same copper layer underneath. I believe that the wires were all connected up to the side. So this is actually the processor silicon and other semiconductor layers right here. Lots of dust on these too. They've been out for a while. And uh, this is an older computer chip. Not quite sure what this is from. But uh, the pieces are a lot bigger. Oh, you can see some physical markings right there. Sometimes computer chip companies will put little markings on their dies. See some pretty funny ones. Let's move this a little bit. Yeah. I can take a look at this little guy. It's a much smaller chip. Same kind of copper spacing on there. Could be a type of memory chip. Does look like a memory chip of some sort. Next to that, we got another older CPU. And I like the older CPUs a lot more than uh, the other chips. You can see where it was soldered along the side here. So all the solder points in the middle of your screen, and then the rest of the actual processor. Next to that, this other little 
ship here. That's quite dusty. Next to that, we have this. This looks like another memory type ship as well. Another type of memory chips. Both of these look like memory chips. Memory chips kind of have large bands of wafers like this for all the uh, memory areas. ship has such nice robust colors. I can't zoom in anymore. Uh, time to lift the stage. Right. Uh, now it's up too high. Can't win, can I? Let's try this intermediary. Hey, we have a winner winner. Yes we do. Uh, it's not, but it does look like. Okay, and over from that one, we have. Uh, let's go actually up. This older CPU. Uh, there might be a CPU. Right, 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 god darn it, god that's dusty, that's why you need a clean room for these chips man, totally, was well, that the same one I was looking at, that's the one I was looking at, okay, yeah, nice, that's a uh, wonderful chip, that's just a beautiful thing to look at. And then next to that, we have another older chip. Another weird assembly. Yeah. Let's get even more zoomed in on these. Now that we can fly around. Alright, starting in the same area. Da -da -da. And this is where we just get to watch the microscope. Just glide along and look at pretty things.
very, very dirty. It's kind of weird, it's kind of pretty damaged. Yeah, well, I think that's it for this video. My project with the microscope and the camera seems to have worked very well. I'm happy with the results. Oh yeah, look at that detail. Yeah, that's it. Stay tuned for more.